He was one of the longest reigning monarchs in history, sitting on the imperial throne for nearly 68 years. He ascended to the throne during a time of revolution and his reign ended during a time of global war. And on this day, 100 years ago, he died in a time of crisis for his empire. I'm speaking of none other than the emperor of Austria-Hungary, Franz Joseph. I'm Indy Neidell. Welcome to a Great War bio special episode about Emperor Franz Joseph. Erzherzog Franz Josef Karl von Österreich, Archduke Franz Joseph Karl of Austria, was born August 18, 1830. He came to power in a time of great political turmoil. The February Revolution in France in 1848 that would see Napoleon III become first president then emperor there was just the beginning of the civilian unrest that turned to open revolution throughout Europe. In Austria, Emperor Ferdinand would stand on his balcony and watch the masses marching towards his palace. Ferdinand was a weak monarch and his minister Felix U. Schwarzenberg, the sixth minister president of that year, persuaded him to abdicate in favor of his nephew, Franz Joseph. I'm not going to go into detail on the 1848 actions here and the fall of Metternich, but your homework is to look it up because it is good to know. On December 2nd, 1848, the 18-year-old Franz Joseph became Emperor of Austria, King of Bohemia, and King of Croatia. The violent revolt at his doorstep had convinced the young emperor that the military would be the key to the empire's continued existence. And that empire was consolidated into a centralized state with the March 1849 constitution and the help of the Russian army to quell rebellion in Hungary. Over the first part of his reign, Franz Joseph hoped to invigorate his monarchy with a reactionary approach, centralizing power in Vienna, though this antagonized the elite in Poland and Hungary. After his defeat at the hands of the French at the Battle of Solferino in 1859, he gradually realized that his Neo-absolutism, though strong theoretically, would not secure the political and financial support of the elite in a multinational empire. He opened negotiations with Hungary, his most powerful and most disgruntled ally, about a new constitution that would see fruition in 1867, giving Hungary special status in the now Austro-Hungarian Empire. In return, the Hungarian parliament offered Franz Joseph the crown of Hungary, which they had denied him before in 1848. From this point on, he opened his arms to his people in the East with the motto, Viribus Unitis, with United Forces. And perhaps nowhere displayed this more than during his famous Kaiserreise in 1880 through Poland and Galicia. By allowing political power to flow from Vienna to the provinces and freeing Polish culture, he transformed the dissatisfied Polish into ardent patriots. He also gave the large Jewish population full citizens' rights and acknowledged them publicly. I do have to point out, though, that when ethnic Romanians in Transylvania petitioned for political power alongside that of the minority Hungarian population there, he turned a deaf ear to them. But he was generally quite well-loved. Knightly, and at the same time impressive as a courteous personage, the adored monarch has awakened in the hearts of all his subjects true patriotic inspiration, from which arises true love of throne and monarchy promising to bring forth at each moment the most beautiful fruit of unshaken, submissive loyalty. In terms of his personal life, in 1852 he had traveled to Berlin partly to find a wife, partly to build stronger ties with the northern German states. Both failed due to Prussian influence. He would marry Elizabeth from Bavaria, known as Sissi, and though the marriage was not unhappy, it was distant. Elizabeth hated the stiff nature of the Austrian court, while Franz Joseph was devoted to his duties. He believed it to be his God-given duty to run the empire. He awoke each day at 4 a.m. to attend to affairs of state. Though he did meddle in all those affairs, he was never really a despot. He would never be iron-handed like the Russian czars, but he would also never identify himself with the Germanic people of his empire, like, say, Kaiser Wilhelm. It wasn't other monarchs, though, that were most dangerous to the Austrian state back then, but rather future German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, at the time Prussian minister president and foreign minister. Bismarck saw that in a coming German empire, the multicultural Austria-Hungary had no place. 
and Prussian dominance had to be established, if need be, on the battlefield. Even after losing to the French, Franz Joseph felt his army could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Prussia, but its lack of modernization in terms of weapons and tactics showed on the battlefield at Königgratz in 1866. This ended the seven-week war between Austria and Prussia, and resulted in Austria losing Venetia, but also its voice in the Deutsche Bund, the German Confederation created in 1815. Franz Joseph was now cut off from German politics. Many of his generals urged revenge, perhaps through an alliance with France, and timing certainly suggested that as France and Prussia headed for war in 1870. But he did not want another brotherly war, and Franz Joseph detested Napoleon III. You can decide for yourself if this was a missed opportunity or not, but you can see how one person sets the course for an empire. But this was the thing. Franz Joseph's empire didn't have many friends. France or Britain might have been a viable partner since Austria had no intercontinental colonial aspirations, but Franz Joseph was looking to the Balkans, which was growing to be quite the tinderbox. The Austrian occupation of Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1878 provoked a lot of anti-Austrian sentiment down there, which Russia was happy to exploit. And over the last couple of decades of the 19th century, Austria ended up growing more and more dependent on what was now the German Empire as its ally, and Franz Joseph grew more fatalistic in outlook. Much of this stemmed from disasters in his personal life. Over the years, his daughter died, his mother died, his two brothers died. A huge tragedy was the suicide of his son and heir to the throne, Rudolf, in 1889. And then, Elizabeth was murdered by an Italian anarchist. Franz Joseph, though he loved his son, had hated his son's liberal policies, and Rudolf's successor as heir to the throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, declared himself the strongest opposition to the emperor, and Franz Joseph became increasingly isolated. By the time of Franz Ferdinand's assassination and the July crisis in 1914, the old emperor had no one to rely on but the voices of his military high command, particularly his chief of staff, Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf, who had repeatedly urged him to wage war in the Balkans. By repeatedly, I mean dozens of times. He still wasn't goaded into war with Serbia, though, and only issued his ultimatum to Serbia after he was personally convinced that other nations would not intervene. He was very wrong about that. He felt that he was going to war not in anger, but what he saw was Austria's rightful place in the world. During the war, he left military decisions to his general staff. What he did was endorse war funds and work to help war widows, orphans, the hungry, and the homeless. As long as he lived, he was the public symbol of the unity of the empire, and his soldiers had a commonly beloved father figure. In fact, many soldiers from various ethnicities of the empire, Polish, Hungarian, Ruthenian, and so forth, still felt that they owed their rights to him, and many identified loyalty to the empire with loyalty to Franz Joseph. It was an enormous blow to the nation and the war effort when he died November 21st, 1916, aged 86 of pneumonia of the right lung. He was very much a man of the 19th century, and it's not a stretch to say that his policies and visions did not really have a place in the world of the 20th centuries. He saw his power as divine right and hated political innovations and more modern liberal ideas. He was no politician, but he did love his people and wished only to preserve his empire, which had been deeply scarred by the events of his youth. However, he couldn't compete with Bismarck's genius, and he was unwilling to drag his country out of its political isolation, which led to its eventual dependence on Germany as its major ally. His personal dependence on his military leaders and the events that culminated in the First World War. If you'd like to learn more about Franz Joseph's legendary chief of staff, you can click here for our Konrad von Hotzendorf episode. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.